AQA, A-level physics, orbits of planets and satellites. So this bit of the specification, let's go. Okay, now this drawing was actually drawn by Isaac Newton. Um, and it explains how an object can stay in orbit around the Earth. Because basically what's happening is that, let's say you fire a, a cannonball off the top of a mountain, then ignoring air resistance, uh, it could be if it was traveling fast enough, falling, 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 falling to Earth, but never actually hitting the Earth because its path would follow the curvature of the Earth. OK, an object in orbit is continually falling towards the Earth. Um, if the satellite is traveling at the right speed, then it would follow the curvature of the Earth and it would never hit the Earth if there was nothing to slow it down, like air resistance. Now, for any radius, the object must be traveling at a certain speed for a circular orbit. And basically, the bigger the radius, then the smaller the speed that you need, as we shall see. But for a particular radius, for a circular orbit, there's only one possible speed. Uh, also, ignoring any air resistance, then the only force acting on the satellite is the gravitational attraction of the Earth. So that is the centripetal force that keeps it going round in a circle. This guy, Johannes Kepler. Now, he's famous for his laws of planetary motion. Uh, and he came up with these laws. You don't need to know them. Well, the third one you actually do. What he did was he, he took lots of data from other astronomers, one of them, a guy called Tycho Brahe, was a very interesting character, had a, had a golden nose. Um, but Ke Kepler noticed, worked out patterns. Looking at this table, we've got the, the planets that people knew about, which was up till Saturn. Uh, we've got the orbital radius. Now, uh, AU is astronomical units. So basically, Earth is one, astronomical unit from the sun. So if the radius of the Earth is one, then all of the other numbers there are relative to that. Uh, and then the period in Earth years. So Earth is one, one, and then all of the other planet data there is relative to that. Now, looking at those numbers, there is an obvious pattern, isn't there, which is that the bigger the orbital radius, the bigger the period, the longer it takes it to go around the sun. But what I would like you to do, uh, if this is your first time on this video, is work out in this last column here, work out T squared, and then work out R cubed, and then divide T squared by R cubed. And you will notice something very interesting and that is basically I'm, I'm not going to tell you what it is on this slide Kepler's third law now you need to be able to derive you need to show that t squared is proportional to r cubed okay it actually says on the specification that you need to derive it so we start with f equals ma it's usually where we start with. So F is GMM over R squared. Uh, A is, well, MA is MV squared over R because it's circular motion. So we can cancel the little M's. We can cancel one of the R's. Yes, and we end up with GM over R equals V squared. Okay, quite a useful equation later on, actually, is that V is root GM over R for a circular orbit, V is root GM over R. We might use that later on. But anyway, we also have uh, V equals omega R, uh, where omega equals two pi over T. So we've got another expression for V squared, which is V squared is four pi squared R squared over T squared. So what we do is we substitute for V squared. So we bung that in there, 
and we do a bit of cancelling and you do it yourself and you end up with this here. So uh, as I said, you need to be able to do this. You might be asked to do this. Show that T squared is proportional to R cubed. Energy and orbits. I actually covered this in the last video. Um, there's a, an object in orbit around a, a planet. Uh, its kinetic energy is a half mv squared. Its GPE is mv, where v is the potential at that radius. So that's minus mgm over r. But we know that the total energy is negative because if it wasn't negative, then the object would have enough kinetic energy to escape and it would escape the Earth's gravitational field. Which brings us on to escape velocity. How fast would an object have to be moving away from the Earth to escape the Earth's gravitational field? Obviously ignoring air resistance, I'll keep saying that. Well, that will be when its kinetic energy is greater than its negative potential energy. So a half mv squared would be equal to mgm over r, that's mv, and that m times big V potential. Uh, so the escape velocity works out at root 2gm over r. Now, can you use that equation, I've given you the data there, to work out a value for the Earth's escape velocity? If you don't know it, work it out. Uh, and the answer is actually about 11 kilometers a second. That's the Earth's escape velocity, about 11 kilometers a second. I like this diagram and this is quite interesting. If you fired your cannonball um, at eight kilometers a second, you'd go into a close orbit. If you fired it between eight and 11 kilometers a second, you'd actually go into an elliptical orbit but it wouldn't escape, it would eventually come back. That's like very much like the orbit of comets. Comets have a very elliptical orbit around the sun. If you fired your cannonball with more than 11 kilometers per second or 11.2, then it would escape. You'd never see your cannonball again. It would get to infinity and possibly beyond. There are two important orbits that we need to know a bit about. We did these at GCSE. Uh, close orbit. Now, close orbit is close to the surface of the Earth. It's just above the Earth's atmosphere. And you only need to go about 100 kilometers upwards to be above the Earth's atmosphere. So, uh, and it's very useful if it goes over the poles, if it's a, a low polar orbit, because then as the Earth rotates, it can actually look at every single point on the Earth. Okay, if you make kind of, if you want to have a jolly good look at, you know, Australia, then you can adjust the orbit and in a couple of hours time, you can have it looking above Australia. Okay, um, we worked out before uh, V equals root GM over R, which is actually for any orbit, any circular orbit, V is root GM over R. And if you put R in that equation as the radius of the Earth, then you can work out the velocity of the orbit, you can work out the period of the orbit, uh, and I suggest you do that. The other orbit that we need to know is this thing called a geostationary orbit. So if the satellite has a period of 24 hours, uh, and it needs to be above the equator, then what happens is that it will be above the same point on the Earth all of the time. Uh, obviously very useful for communication satellites. Your satellite dish is pointing at a communication satellite and it is in the same point in the sky all of the time because as the Earth rotates, it orbits the Earth. Now, it would have to be above the equator because the center of the orbit has to be the center of the Earth. And in which case, this, this area of space is actually, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of satellites at this particular radius above the equator. 
And so, you know, not only is, you know, above certain populated parts of the world, it getting a bit crowded. The signals from these satellites can start interfering with each other. Now, you remember when I talked about Kepler's third law, we derived this equation, t squared is 4 pi squared over gm times r cubed. Now, if you put t as 24 hours in this equation, uh, and then you can find the radius of a geostationary orbit, and then if you know the radius, you should be able to work out the velocity. And then just to prove I'm not being lazy, I actually recommend that you learn this table. If you have to work out this, that or the other in the exam, if you know what answer to expect, then it helps, you know, if you've messed it up. So close orbit, it's the radius is the radius of the Earth. Uh, if you work out the period, it should be about 88 minutes. So it's not around the world in 80 days, it's around the world in 80 minutes. And the velocity is about eight kilometers a second. For the geostationary orbit, it works out at about seven times the radius of the Earth. Okay, uh, the period is 24 hours and the velocity should work out at about three kilometers per second. It is worth learning that data because you might have to work any of those out. And as I said, you'll know what to expect.